a little bit fired up today, church. You got to be fired up. Pentecost Sunday. We are Pentecost people, are we not? If you didn't know that about us, we are. You might be finding that out today a little more than you ever have before, but we are still an Acts chapter 2 kind of people. And if you're going, well, what's Acts chapter 2? Hang on. If you got a Bible with you this morning, open with me, please, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Several weeks ago, we began a series called What's Right With You? I know a lot of people know what's wrong with them, and they like talking about it. They like telling about it. And you got to be careful who you ask what's wrong with you, because they will tell you what's wrong with you. But church, we got to be careful about how much talking we're doing about what's wrong. Just ask the Holy Spirit to help you sometime, to help you kind of sneak up behind you. Do you know what I mean by that? What would it be like if you kind of stepped outside yourself and you could hear yourself talk? How much talk would you find that you're doing about the problem? How much talk would you find that you're doing about what you don't have, about what you don't know, about what you need? Come on, are you listening? Yes. We got to be careful how much talking we're doing about these things because the more we magnify the problem, the bigger the problem gets in our eyes. Yes. And the problem is you've never fixed the problem by talking about the problem. Oh, yeah. Doesn't work. What you've got to do is find out what's right with you. When there's something wrong and you know it's wrong, when you see what's wrong, when you feel what's wrong, you got to run to what's right. Somebody say, there's something right with me. Something really right with me. And you find out what that is here in the book of 2 Corinthians. And I want to fast forward. All of this is so good. But skip down to verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, can I see the hands of those that are in Christ? So this verse is about you. And he says, because you're in Christ, you are a new creation. You are a new creation. Old things. That's the old you. The old you has passed away. Aren't you glad we don't have funerals for the old you? That would be a depressing service. I mean, all the bad stuff that people would have to say about the old you. <laughs> but the old you, somebody say it, the old me is dead and gone, passed away. Say this, behold, all things have become new. Who needs drugs and alcohol when you got 2 Corinthians 5.17? If you actually believe this stuff, it gets you as high as a kite, man. You would be so thrilled to find out the old me is dead and gone. Come on, are you listening this morning? That took me about 90 seconds to start preaching up in this place today. The old you's dead and gone. All things have been made new. You are a new creation in Christ Jesus. Glory to God. He says in verse 18, all things are of God who's reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses. That means not holding their sins against them. I am so glad God dropped it. We got to be people more like God who drops it. Sometimes you got to drop it. You know what I mean by that? Quit holding things against people. Stop holding people's sin against them. Yeah, well, you don't know what they did. Yeah, but I know what you did, and you know what I did, and we all did the same did, and God's not holding any of that against us. He dropped it. He let it go. Can you let it go? You'll be much happier if you do. He was not imputing our trespasses. He was not holding our sins against us. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. That's an awesome thought. To think that God it can talk not just to you, through you. 
pleading through you with other people, be reconciled to God. We're ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, here's what's right with you. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we, say it with me, might become the righteousness of God in him. Did you hear that word? Righteousness. This is what's right with you. Not what's going to be right with you. Not what may be right with you someday. Not what will be right with you if you work hard enough. No, it's what's right with you and it's what's right with you right now. Right now. Right now. You are the righteousness of God in him. This verse in uh, the New Living Translation says, says it like this. God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God. Do you hear those words? Made right with God through Christ. From the Amplified Classic Bible, it says that, uh, that we through him might become the righteousness of God. And here's what that means. Do we have this for you? Go ahead to that next screen. That we might become uh, viewed as being the, the examples of righteousness, what we ought to be. That's what it is to be righteous. It's what you ought to be. Approved and acceptable, and I like this phrase, in right relationship with God. What's right with you? You're approved. Not disapproved, approved. You are accepted, which means you're not rejected. Is that something that people deal with sometimes their whole lives long? Rejection? Feel like they were rejected by a father or a mother? Rejected by somebody in authority? Rejected by their family? Well, it doesn't matter who on this earth rejects you. You are accepted. You are accepted in the beloved. And that's something you should say and say often. That's what's right with you. You are approved, not disapproved. You are accepted, not rejected. And what else? You are in right relationship with him. Right relationship with him. There is nothing in this life so sweet as when relationships are right. That is the sweetness of life. And if you've ever been in a relationship where things were not right, where things were wrong, things were off, things were tumultuous and full of strife, you know there's no sweetness about that. But when that relationship is restored and there's reconciliation, that is the sweetness of life. To be in right relationship with somebody. The scripture talks about how good and how pleasant it is when brethren, that's you and me, dwell together in unity. The sweetness of life is being in right relationship. And how much more so to be in a right relationship with God. I want to give you a, 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 an additional working definition today for what it means to be right or righteous. To be righteous is to be right in the sight of God. Amen. Listen to it again. To be righteous is to be right in the sight of God. And even going all the way back to the Old Testament, there were those that had a taste of it. They, they were not made the righteousness of God in Christ like you and I have been. But yet, for example, Moses would talk to God and he would say, if we have found favor in your sight, which is the only place you and I find favor. It's the only place we find righteousness. It's in the sight of God. Or in other words, it's in knowing how God sees you. When you get a revelation of how he sees you, well, how does he see me? Accepted, not rejected. Approved, not disapproved. And in right relationship with him. What is it to be righteous? It is to be right in the sight of God. Amen? Now, we've talked quite a bit about this already. And if you've missed any of it, all these messages are available to you. And I encourage you to go back and get them. But I want to ask a question and answer it today. How do you know when you actually believe this. 
It's one thing for you and I to sit up in here and even to read scriptures that declare we are the righteousness of God in Christ. And you can amen that, you can nod up and down, and you can, you know, make gestures, I suppose, that, that demonstrate, yeah, I'm on board with that, I, I, I agree with that. But there's supposed to be proof. There is supposed to be evidence in our lives of what we believe and in whom we believe. Your life and my life, we're, we're to be so different than the way the rest of this world lives and thinks, walks and talks. There's supposed to be a difference. And my question to you this morning is, how would we know? If I'm looking at your life, your day-to-day -day life, how would I know you actually believe this? Believe what? That you're the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm going to give you one evidence today. I know there's a number of things we could probably look at through Scripture, but I want to focus on one thing today. That if you really believed you were the righteousness of God in Christ, this would be in your life. Now, one of the most significant things that you or I or anybody could ever find out in this life is who you are in Jesus and who Jesus is in you. The revelation of who you are in him is life-changing and it's destiny-altering. But how do we know when you believe it? Not just you've heard it before, not just you amen it on a Sunday morning, you actually believe it. Go with me to the book of Proverbs, chapter 28. We'll read just one verse. And it's verse one. And let's go ahead and put this on the screen. I want us all to see it. We're looking for the evidence that you believe, you actually believe that you are the righteousness of God. This verse says, Proverbs 28, verse one, that the wicked flee. That means they run away when no one pursues the wicked. This is what life looks like for them. Constantly on the run. They flee, you could add, in fear when there's not even anybody chasing them. And that is how most of this world is living life. Constantly on the run from what? I don't know. Everything. Because we have got a world and a culture in our world that, that generates fear. And now with the advent of 24-hour news cycles and people, what they're feeding on nonstop, whether it's television or internet or social or whatever it is, there is fear constantly being pumped into people, something to be afraid of. And people can turn anything into fear. They have found out fear sells. Fear sells. People feed on this stuff. They're constantly looking for something. What's the next thing I'm supposed to be afraid of? What's the next thing I'm supposed to be worried about? What's the next variant? Well, there's another one coming. I can tell you that. There's no, oh, there it is. Knew it. Constantly afraid. Constantly afraid of what? Climate. That we should be afraid. If we don't do something right now, the world will end in 12 years. Constantly afraid. Living in stark terror of the weather. Of a volatile economy. Of gas prices that rise and fall. This is how people live life. Constantly afraid, constantly running from something. And the Bible says they're running when there's not even anything chasing them. But our lives are supposed to look different. Am I right, church? Look at the contrast. The wicked flee, they run when nothing's pursuing them. But the, the who? The right in the sight of God. What defines their life? Fear? No. Shame? No. no, what? Boldness, glory to God. The right in the sight of God, these folks ain't like the wicked. They ain't running from nothing. They are bold and bold as a lion. 
Come on, let me hear you lying this morning. You got, a, you got a roar on the inside of you, and you're about to let that thing out. As a matter of fact, this message today is called the roar of the righteous. Because there is a sound on the inside of you that is a bold sound. It is not a sound of fear. It is not a sound of timidity. It is not the sound of condemnation or sin consciousness. It is the boldness of the righteous. Amen? And our boldness is to be the same kind of boldness that you see in a lion. Now, I don't know if you've ever been eye to eye with a lion. Now, I know we all did the sixth grade field trip. We went to the zoo and you just kind of hoped and prayed that lion might be outside his cage walking around. I know most of the time I went to the zoo. I grew up in Fort Worth, Texas, and we always went at the end of the school year, getting close to the summer, which meant it was 198 degrees outside. (laughs) None of us wanted to be out there. That lion didn't want to be out there. So he ain't even out there. He's somewhere back in the cage chilling out. But most of us, our experience with the lions is like that. You know, they're in captivity, they're locked up. In 2012, Sarah and I, with our little two and a half year old Justice, went to South Africa. And we were ministering there for a couple of weeks and we had a day off and our host wanted to take us to the lion park. They do zoos a little differently in Africa. (laughs) In Africa, you're the one in the cage, (laughs) not them. And there's a lion park right there in Johannesburg, South Africa. As a matter of fact, you from within the park can see houses. And I wonder sometimes how these people feel about living so close (laughs) to a bunch of lions. We wanted to go to the lion park. As a matter of fact, I had been a few days before uh, Sarah and Justice got there. Jordan was with me on the first part of the trip, and and our guide took us to the lion park. And that day, I actually got bit by a lion. The lion was about that big, a little little cub. They let us play with the lion. Uh, But I so loved it that I thought, man, Sarah and Justice especially, they're going to love this. And the day Jordan and I went with our host, we just drove through in our host's car, which they let you do. It ain't like America, folks. I always think to myself, did I sign a release form? How does insurance feel about this? As a matter of fact, this morning, thinking about some of this early, I thought, what was that lion part called? So I actually looked it up online. And one of the first things that popped up when I looked online was a video of a family in that very park. And you can hear the voice of a young girl. She's got her phone in the back seat and she's videoing these lions. And this lioness walks up to the car and it is eye level with that rear window. And and the girl, you can hear, dad, you may just want to pull forward. There's a lioness coming in there, kind of lighthearted. That lioness opens the door with her mouth. I'm watching a video and my heart starts pounding. (laughs) And it took me back to the day that Sarah and I took our little guy to the lion park. And this day we didn't go through in our own car. We took the tour, which meant we got in the cage and the cage was set on the back of a pickup truck and our guide was driving the truck and they drive you through the park and the lions are just walking around. And they're mostly docile and kind of chill in the middle of the day. But as we were pulling up to a little pack, our guide turns around and says, you may just want to keep an eye on him. Talking about justice. Our two-year-old. And I thought, okay, why? And they said, you know, these lioness, they know how to find the weak ones. And right as our guide is saying that, and Sarah is my witness of this, there was a lioness. Now, ladies, you'll be interested in this. They're the ones that do the hunting. They're the ones you got to watch out for. That lioness rises up and locks eyes on justice. I mean, I'm as far as I am from me to you right now. There's a lion walking towards us. And we're just in this little cage in a little truck. And that lion locked eyes on him and came to our truck. 
stood up on her rear legs, put her paws on the cage like this, and now we're just inches away. My heart's beating fast. I don't know if you've ever looked into the eyes of a lion from that close. If you haven't, don't. Yeah. But I have. Now, at that time in Little Justice's life, his favorite story was David. And he loved the part about David killing the lion. And our little two-year-old, in the moment, without any poking or prodding from mom and dad, you know what he said? I rebuke you, power of God. <laughs> With his fist in the air, mama says. I rebuke you, power of God. And I thought, that's right, my buddy. No, I'm kind of bowed up to that line. Yeah, you better get down. I'll open up a can of David on you right now. You don't want none of that. But that was a look in the eyes of an animal I have never seen before. Can I tell you what wasn't in that lion's eyes? Any fear. Not a trace. No fear at all. What are the righteous? Are we supposed to be living our lives in fear? Afraid of what's always coming? Afraid of that next pandemic? Afraid of that next disease? Afraid of that next virus? That next bug? That next variant? Afraid of the next downturn in the economy? Afraid of the weather? Afraid, afraid, afraid? No! No! Not, there's not supposed to be a trace of that stuff in us because the righteous, the right in the sight of God are bold as a lion. Boldness. This is how we know you believe this stuff. There'll be a boldness about you. Boldness. It's a defining characteristic of the righteous. Do you know it takes some guts to be a Christian in 2023? The time that you and I are living in right now is not for the faint and it's not for the weak of heart. It takes some spiritual guts to be a believer today. And you and I can be bold, but not bold in ourselves, bold in what Jesus has done. Now, there are some symptoms, there are some evidence of those who don't believe they're the righteousness of God. Those things would be some things we've already talked about, some fear. Shame is a symptom. Timidity, sin consciousness, lacking in confidence. Now, I'm not talking to you today about being arrogant. I'm talking about being confident. Well, what's the difference? Arrogance is simply confidence minus the awareness of Jesus. Listen to that again. Arrogance is confidence minus the awareness of Jesus. So what is confidence? That's not boldness in myself. That's not boldness in my own education, my own experience. That's a source of boldness and confidence that comes from knowing who I am in him comes from knowing that I am right in the sight of God. One of the symptoms of those who don't believe they are the righteousness of God is that they just tolerate the enemy. They just constantly put up with and deal with his stealing, his killing, and his destroying. They don't resist. They don't rebuke. And one of the major symptoms of not believing you are the righteousness of God is powerlessness. In studying some of these things, I came across another verse, and you'll like this. This is out of the book of Isaiah chapter 5, verse 29. He said, their roaring will be like a lion. They will roar like young lions. Yes, they will roar and lay hold of the prey. This is... These two things here kind of sum up the boldness of a lion. The, the lion roars and the lion lays hold. The lion roars and the lion lays hold. I think as the Lord leads us, we'll carry that last part into next week. Let me talk to you just a little bit about the roar of the righteous. Found this out, that a lion's roar can reach 114 decibels. Now, for some frame of reference, that would be like having a rock band in here putting on a, a concert at full volume. That's, that's about what 114 decibels is. A lion's roar can be heard from up to five miles away. 
And they use their roar to warn intruders and they use their roar to mark their territory. Now I have a golden doodle <laughs> and he also marks his territory, but it is not with a 114 decibel roar. They use their roar to mark out what belongs to them and to keep away those who would steal, to warn away intruders. When you study boldness and what it actually means, I love this, we've talked about it some in the past, but the word boldness defined literally means unreservedness of speech. Unreservedness of speech. That's not a timid roar. That's not a sheepish roar. Lions aren't known for their timidity, are they? Their fear. Boldness has to do with what's coming out of your mouth. The words that are coming out of your mouth. Confidence is in the heart. Boldness is in the mouth. And it's an unreservedness of speech. You want to know what it really is? It's free speech. Boldness is free speech. Now the wicked right now are running in terror. They're going to take away our free speech. They're trying to rob us of our rights, our free speech. Listen to me. If you're the righteousness of God, can nobody rob you of your free speech? Free speech was not the idea of those who founded this government. Free speech was in the heart of God thousands and thousands of years ago. Free speech is a gift not given to you just by the United States government or the Constitution of the United States, although we are thankful for it and we are grateful forever to have it. My free speech is a gift that came from the throne of grace. Your free speech is a gift from God and nobody can take it from you. He has given you the ability to speak unreservedly, to speak freely, and to roar with the boldness of a lion because you are right in the sight of God. If you believe this, this would be a defining characteristic in your life. Now we have an example of a lion in scripture. The book of Revelation calls Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. Amen? And you can look through the gospel accounts and you can see some boldness. Do you think when Jesus ministered, there was any trace of fear in his eyes? Do you think there was a tone of shame in his voice? Or do you think he ministered and he roared with perfect confidence and clarity? Because it takes some boldness. You go back and look at some of the stuff he said and some of the stuff he did. I don't know why we read the Bible in such a boring tone. But it took some boldness to say the stuff he said. It took some confidence when he's preaching in a house and somebody starts digging open the roof and they're letting down a man who's paralyzed, it takes some boldness in the presence of a bunch of religious people to say, son, your sins are forgiven you. And all the religious people in there, oh, 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 how dare he? How dareth he forgive? Only God can forgive. It takes some boldness in the face of religion, in the face of tradition to preach the truth. And Jesus said, oh yeah, you think that's bad? Watch this. Rise up, take up your mat and walk. You walking home today, brother. It takes some boldness to look at somebody paralyzed and say, rise and walk. You don't get results by being afraid. You want the same results Jesus got? You got to say not only what he said, but the way he said it. There's got to be some boldness rising up on the inside of you. Amen. It takes some boldness to stand up in the bow of a ship. When it looks like you are sinking and it looks like you are going down in the storm, it takes some boldness to look at wind, to look at waves, and to shout, peace. Be still. Why do we read that and think he said, peace, be still. Come on, that's not how he said it. He said it with some boldness. The lion of the tribe of Judah has roared. And the wind and the waves said, yes, okay, sorry, yes. Peace, be still. It takes some boldness. It takes some boldness to walk up to the tomb 
of a man who's been dead four days. It takes some boldness when you know that the man's family's there and all the local religious leaders have come. It takes some boldness to pray and to pray out loud. Father, I pray. I know you hear me. You always hear me when I pray. That's some boldness, isn't it? I'm praying this now so that they can hear me. You know Jesus didn't walk up to the tomb, knock on the rock. <laughs> Lazarus. Psst. Hey, buddy. What did he say? Roll the stone away. But Jesus, he's been dead four days. What did I say? I said, if you'd believe, you would see the glory of the Lord. Take some boldness to say that. To tell somebody they will see. You know what doesn't take boldness? You never know what God's going to do. Sometimes he does. Sometimes he doesn't. God in his sovereignty and in his great mysterious plan. That takes no boldness. That is fear. It's fear of what other people are going to think. What if I say that and it doesn't happen? What if I say that and they, oh, they hear me? Fear of other people is a boldness killer. Fear of what others might think is a confidence killer. Do you think Jesus ever once was concerned what the Pharisees might think? You know he wasn't. Because with boldness, he looked at him in the eye and said, you bunch of snakes, you brood of vipers, woe unto you. It takes some boldness to say that to the people you know are going to kill you. No fear. That's our lion. That's our lion. And we have been made righteous with that lion's righteousness. We have that same boldness. It takes some boldness to say, roll away the stone. It takes some boldness to stand out there and in front of a dead man and a bunch of other people, lift your voice and say, Lazarus, come forth. That was some boldness that day, wasn't it? Tell me about the results. What did that produce? That man came walking out wrapped in those grave clothes and he said, loose him and let him go. You want those results? Say not only what he said, but how he said it. Boldness is a defining characteristic of those who are right in the sight of God. Go to the book of Mark chapter 1. Let me give you one more example of Jesus and his boldness. And then we'll look at the way it shows up in our lives. Because this is not something, you can't point to this and say, well, you know, that was Jesus. That's the Son of God. No, he's our example. Mark chapter 1, you'll read something here that you see repeated in several places throughout Scripture. But you see this beginning in verse 21, Mark 1, 21. It says, They went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue and he taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority. That's what really blew these people away. That's what these people could not figure out about him. His teaching had a different tone about it. His teaching had something in it they'd never heard before. And this goes on to say he didn't teach as one of the scribes, as one of the Pharisees. They heard all that before. Man, they'd heard the law. They heard it taught. They heard it preached over and over and over again. They'd heard it all. And they heard it in that same, probably very monotone voice. They probably heard people say this, and this was the tradition, and we must hold to the tradition of the elders, and God, there is one, but one God, and but one Lord. And okay, true. Does it have to be that boring? <laughs> Here comes Jesus. Maybe even saying some of those same things. Maybe he, even, he even brought to light the law. and some, Maybe some of the things they'd heard before, but they'd never heard it this way. There was a tone about it. There was something in it 
they'd never experienced. And they could not figure it out. He teaches as one who has what? Authority. Authority. They were astonished, verse 22, at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Verse 23 says, now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit, and this unclean spirit cried out. This, this unclean spirit's making some noise. He's crying out. This is distracting. He's saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him. Let me say it to you like this. The lion of the tribe of Judah roared and said, be quiet. Come out of him. Why on earth would we read that like, be quiet? Come out of him. No, it was the authority in it. It was the boldness in it. And I'm not saying you got to be loud because God's hard of hearing. That's not what this is about. But notice what's happening here. You've got an evil spirit that's crying out. Well, we need the voice of righteousness to be louder than that voice. And so much of the time when you have got symptoms in your body, feelings of pain, when you're dealing with something, that thing is talking to you and it's talking loud. And you have got to give voice to the roar of the righteous that's on the inside of you. And sometimes you got to lift up a shout that's louder than the voice of doubt. You got to lift up a praise that's louder than the voice of pain. You got to lift up a shout of praise and thanksgiving to God, your provider that's louder than the lack. Are you listening to me? It's the voice of boldness. It's the voice of authority. And that's what Jesus ministered with. He said, be quiet, be come out, uh, come out of him. When the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him and they were all amazed. And they questioned among them saying, themselves saying this, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. And immediately fame spread throughout all the region around Galilee. And Jesus went from there. You know what his next stop was? Peter's mother-in-law's house. He walked in there and she was on the bed sick with a fever. And Jesus walked up to her. You know what the Bible says? He rebuked the fever. Jesus talked to the fever. He's not talking to God. I hope you're listening to this. This is not a prayer. This is not a request made unto God. Jesus is talking to the fever and he rebuked it. That is a strong word to rebuke. And we know that the fever can hear because the very next verse is she got up. And she was restored and she was healed because he spoke to that fever. This is the roar of the righteous, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Now, as we wrap this up, go with me to the book of Acts, bearing in mind that he's our example. And these are not things that are just exclusive to him or his ministry or his deity. I want you to see this at work in the lives of the disciples. In Acts chapter 2, you're familiar with this. We talked about it a moment ago. This is the day that they were all gathered together in that upper room, and there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. The Bible says it filled the house where they waited. Tongues of fire sat on each one of them. They began to speak with other tongues, and they all praised God, and they came stumbling drunk out of that upper room. Everybody thought they'd been drinking all morning long. But the Spirit of God came on Peter, and he began to boldly preach. And he preached a message that day so bold, so big, that 3,000 people were added to the church. It was the result of that boldness. They came on him when he was filled with the Spirit. Now you get to Acts chapter 3, 
And in verse 1, it says, Peter and John went together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms, fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. Now listen to the way he said it. Not just reading the words, listen for that tone. Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, come here, I, I, uh, I don't want to say this too loud. Uh, there's a, man, there's a lot of Pharisees around here. And gosh, you know what they're capable of. But listen, I, I was, can I whisper this to you? No. He said, look at us. The man gave him his attention. And Peter said, verse six, silver and gold I do not have. But what I do have... I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand. This is boldness right here. To grab a man who can't walk and yank that joker up and tell him, rise and walk. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them walking, leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew it was him who sat there begging. And it drew a crowd of people. I bet it did. Peter's shouting. He's yelling, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And everybody turns to see what's going on. And that dude that had been laying there every day for 40 years, he's no longer lame. He's up, he's dancing, he's walking, he's leaping, he's praising God. It gets a crowd of people. And Peter, who just a few days ago denied even knowing Jesus. When they said, hey, aren't you with him? No, I don't know what you're talking about. Fear, shame, timidity. But what's changed? This boy got filled with the Holy Ghost and this boldness rises up in him and he starts preaching to people and he's not preaching some mealy mouth message. He's preaching Jesus and he looks at him and he said, yeah, you know, Jesus, the one you crucified. Yeah, him. And he began to preach what would happen if they would repent. You know what takes some boldness to tell people to repent? He preached repentance. And the Bible says that 2,000 more were added. But this caused such a stir that the religious guys heard about it and they gathered around and they weren't very happy about it. And it says in verse 8 that Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man by what means he's been made well, let it be known to all y'all. That's my translation. And to all the people of Israel, that the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Somebody say boldness. I can prove it to you. Verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were untrained or uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. They marveled. They saw the boldness. Not only did they see it, they heard it. Peter's preaching. There's boldness coming out his mouth. And they figured out these are not trained men. These are not educated men. In other words, their confidence didn't come from their education, didn't come out of their training in the scriptures. Where does their confidence come from? They identified where it came from. They perceived they were uneducated and untrained men. They marveled and they realized they had been with Jesus. These guys sound just like that guy. These guys are bold, roaring, just like that guy did. I thought we got rid of this problem. Nope, you just made it worse. And it goes on to say, seeing verse 14, the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it, but they commanded them to go out of the council 
They conferred among themselves saying, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about these men? Indeed, a notable miracle has been done through them. It's evident to all. We can't deny it. There's proof. Everybody who dwells here sees it. We can't deny it. Verse 17, but so that it spreads no further among the people, what are we going to do? Let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. What's the enemy trying to do? Shut them up. Satan doesn't like words of faith coming out of your mouth. There is nothing that scares him more than the roar of the righteous. So what they'd come up with, this plan, we're going to threaten them. We'll threaten them. And I don't know what the threat was. We'll take away your land. We'll take away your house. We'll take away your property. We know what these guys are capable of. They just crucified Jesus. So they threatened them in an effort to shut them up. But boldness doesn't shut up. Boldness is unreservedness of speech. So that in verse 18, they called them and commanded them not to speak. Shut up, they said. Don't teach in the name of Jesus. But are you ready for this? Verse 19. Listen to this. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you or to listen to God, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and we have heard. What's he saying? This is what's right. This is what's righteous. This is what's right in the sight of God is for us to speak. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Now I want to read to you verse 23, but I want you to stand up. We're going to put some things into practice here before we go. Musicians, you guys go ahead and come on up. Acts chapter four, verse 23. I want you to notice their response to the threatenings. Notice their response to the enemy trying to shut them up. Verse 23 says, being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So what did they go back and do? They went back to their company of people. They told them about the threats. They told them what they said. They're going to kill us if we keep preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God and with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. Now listen to this, verse 27. They said, for truly against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and, and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand purposed, determined before to be done. Listen, verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and do what? Grant to your servants that with all... With all boldness. boldness, they may what? Speak. speak. When the government is trying to take speech away, what do we do? When religion's trying to rob these guys of their unreservedness and freedom of speech to declare the name of Jesus, what do we do? We go before, before the Lord and we say, God, you heard their threats. I'm asking you, kill them. <laughs> Just send fire down on them, Lord. We need that one out of office and we need this one out. Come on, there's a lot of prayer being prayed like that. Lord, get this one out of office. Put this other one in office. And I want the right people in office just as much as anybody else does. But what was the prayer? Look on their threats and grant us boldness. In other words, I don't care. At the end of the day, my freedom of speech 
and my ability to boldly declare who I am in Jesus and who Jesus is in me is not a gift from my government or any politician. It's not one that they gave and not one they can take away. It is a gift. Grant it to us, Lord. Somebody say it. Grant it to us, Lord. Look on their threats. Say that. Look on their threats, Lord. And grant to your servants boldness. 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 We're asking for boldness. They prayed on and said, grant to your servants boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal. Come on, miracles will give you some boldness. Miracles taking place kind of bow you up a little bit. When somebody gets up and walks that couldn't walk, you say, that's right. <laughs> Look at what Jesus can do. By stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Now listen to how much God liked this prayer. Verse 31. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Boldness. How do we know you believe this stuff? There'll be some boldness about you. There'll be some boldness about you. And you will boldly declare some things. You will say some things about you and you'll say it without fear. You'll say it without trepidation. You'll say it without timidity. You'll say it without condemnation. We'll get into that in time. But nothing kills confidence like condemnation. But there is no condemnation. Come on, I said it. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation to those who are right in the sight of God. And if there's no condemnation, what's keeping you from boldly declaring some things? Have you noticed that about us? When I say us, I mean us, this church. Have you notice how much we talk throughout a service? That's not just so we can hear ourselves talk. That's supposed to be coming out of us. We believe, therefore we speak. We say stuff in here all, all morning long. How many times do I lead you in a confession? Huh? How many times do I say, say this after me, church? How many times do you think in the past few years we have said, we're not running out. We're running over. How many times do you think we've said over and over and over again, we will have more than enough to meet every need to pay every debt, to be a big blessing to a lot of people. You want that to actually produce something in your life? It's not just what you say. It's how you say it. Is there a tone? And when you're just kind of just passing time and saying it out of habit, I don't like your tone. I don't, I don't like a tone of, of no confidence. I don't like a tone of powerlessness. Come on, we want a tone of boldness, don't we? This ought to be happening all the time. You ought to be boldly speaking to your body. You ought to be boldly speaking to your mind. You ought to be boldly declaring the word of God. Grant me boldness, Lord, that I may speak your word to my health, that I may speak your word to my family, that I may speak your word to my finances, to my relationships, to any circumstance in my life. Grant me boldness and I'll declare it. I am the healed of the Lord. I'm healed from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. The word of God is alive and working in me. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm full of the glory of God from, from wall to wall, full of the Holy Ghost and that power is driving out sickness, that power is driving out disease, every germ, every virus, every source of inflammation be removed from me now in the name of Jesus and I'm calling in everything that I need, anything materially, anything financially. I'm calling in the people. I'm calling in the favor. Angels, you go now in Jesus' name and you bring it in. You notice what I'm doing here? This is some boldness, isn't it? This ought to be coming out of your mouth all the time. Because the righteous are as bold as a lion. Come on, give me that roar one more time today, church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We hope you enjoyed this message. 
If you need someone to pray with you, there are several ways for you to contact us. Feel free to give us a call at 817-577-0180. You can also contact us through the Legacy Studios app or either of our websites. Giving options are available online at pearsonsministries.com and legacychurch.family. If you prefer, you can also text an offering. Simply text LEGACY in any dollar amount to the number 28950 and follow the prompts. Be blessed today. We love you. And remember, you are always welcome here in the House of Faith.